Here we go again, part 3 of the car show project. This is where we left it off last time. We're still missing the boxes and the post-processing effect, like the bloom and the RGB shift. Alright, we'll start with the boxes. I've made a new component. This is just a standard mesh with a box geometry and a mesh standard material. The color comes from above as a property and the scale is being set with this use state hook. I'm setting the scale by drawing a random number between 0 and 1 and then I'm elevating it by 2. By elevating it, I'm skewing the distribution a little bit towards the lower numbers. Then I'm multiplying everything by 0 0.5, so this entire code block is going to return a random number between 0 and 0 0.5. And I'm adding 0 0.05 as the lower limit. So basically scale can take any value between 0 0.05 and 0. 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5. The boxes were also randomly rotating in the x and y axis and so I'm just setting a random rotation speed for both axes with meta random. We're almost good to go, I just have to give this box a position. This is how I'm going to do it, so let me walk you through what I'm doing here. Every time we read math.random times 2 minus 1, what I'm essentially doing is drawing a random number between minus 1 and plus 1. Since I'm also multiplying it by 3, the end result is going to be a random number between minus 3 and plus 3. Similarly, the y position goes from 0 0.1 to 2.6 and the z position between minus 15 and plus 15. But the interesting part happens here, so remember, we have set the x position between minus 3 and plus 3, so it's going to look something like that when we are placing the points in our scene. But if the x position is smaller than 0, I am decrementing it by 1.75, so the end result is going to be that these points, like all these points that are below 0, are going to be moved by minus 1.75. On, on the opposite side, if the x position is greater than 0, I'm increasing it by 1.75. So the end result is going to be that I'm sort of spacing these points apart. So instead of the distribution being random like in this box over here, it is still going to be random but between these two boxes that are separated by 1.75 units from each other. Lastly, we have to actually position and rotate the mesh. For position, I'm just setting the initial position that we computed with this method. And for rotation, I'm just adding a small amount on each frame. And this small amount is delta. Delta basically is how long it has passed since the last frame was rendered. We don't want to draw just a single box, we want to draw a hundred boxes. So I'm creating a new component to do just that. And okay. I'm not using the chat way of building an array, like I made a for loop for, with 100 elements and I, you have to forgive me for it, but it was 100 elements, come on, you, were you expecting me to make a, um, were you really expecting me to do that? Okay, I'm doing it, whatever. There you go, 100 element, I hope you're happy now, this is the only right way of building this kind of array, okay? Got it, now we got this part out of the way, we can focus on, on the less important stuff. So for example, the color of each box. If it's an even box, I'm giving it a reddish color, otherwise a bluish one. And I've noticed one small mistake, I can't set positioning here before we are actually initializing the position, so I'm just returning the new vector. Now we're ready to use these boxes in the app component and see them in action in real time. There we go, look at our boxes. They're also correctly spaced, so as you remember, we wanted them to be 1.75 units apart from the center of the scene, just to not run the risk of seeing them inter intersect with the car. They're also rotating properly, so yeah, we're good to go. Now we can move on the post-processing stuff. Alright, so for post-processing effects, I'm just going to copy here the ones that we're going to use. There we go. And just to make sure that you get the right imports, you can find the effect composer along with chromatic aberration and bloom inside reactory post-processing, but the blend function needs to come from just post-processing. The effect composer is a component that basically should wrap all of your post-processing effects. In this case we're using just two and there's another one that's commented out and that I'll show in a moment, but for now let's focus on bloom. With an 8 are going to be used to determine the buffer size of the bloom effect. Uh, you can use higher values to improve the quality of the result, 
but since for our project the bloom is so spread out and strong we don't really care that much about it being pixel perfect so we can use a lower value kernel size is a number between 0 and 5 that determines how spread out the blur effect is going to be and in this case i'm using the maximum value allowed which is 5. on the other hand luminance there shield is a value that determines how strong the luminance of a pixel needs to be for it to take part in the bloom effect so in this case every pixel in the scene whose luminance is lower than 0.15 is going to be to be masked out from the computation of the bloom effect this is very useful when you want for example just your light sources to show the bloom effect in that case you can use a very high value for luminance there show like 95 and most of the objects in your scene will, will not show the bloom effect but the brightest one will and so in this case this is a very useful way of masking out the bloom effect for pixels that are not as bright the next effect is super simple, chromatic aberration just takes offset as a property and you can use two numbers here to determine how strong the, uh, the effect is. I'm using these values here, you can play with them and find other ones that you like, but for the most part that's all there is to this effect. Now let me set back luminance threshold back to 15 and we're ready to see the effect composer in action. I personally love post-processing effects, they can really change the mood of your scene super quickly, especially the bloom. The bloom is very common in many computer graphics projects, so you're going to see it often. And I really love how React Tree Fiber makes it so easy to set up a pipeline to create and show these post-processing effects. And there's one last effect that I wanted to share. I decided at the end not to include it in the final project, but it's a cool effect nonetheless, and that's the depth of field defocus effect that you see in this line over here. And if you uncomment it, you should be able to see uh, this result. As you might have expected, all the elements that are outside of the focus plane of the camera are going to be blurred depending on how far they are from the focus planes. So for example, if I zoom out the scene, almost everything is going to be blurred. And if I zoom in here, for example, just the, back, just the back of the car is going to be fully defined, but everything else is going to get progressively blurrier. I decided not to include it at the end because creating a convincing depth of field effect that works for all kinds of real-time scenes is almost impossible, like it's an extraordinarily difficult task. And you can see already that there are a bunch of um, artifacts over here. Sometimes the boxes are in the middle of the rings that should be fully uh, fully, fully blurred out so it's a very cool effect for some kinds of scenes but I found that the, for this one was not very convincing to me specifically but you might like it so feel free to use it if you do before we wrap this video though I would like to discuss one last component so I want you to download this texture which you can find on my repo I'll post the link in the description and as soon as you have downloaded the grid texture we can start to implement the floating grid which is basically a simple plane mesh on top of which we're applying the grid texture this is the texture so we're applying it both as a diffuse map and as an alpha map when we are applying a texture as an alpha map it's going to use the uh, black values as like the parts of the texture that are going to be fully transparent and then the white values will be fully opaque and of course every value in between would be partially transparent but since here we just have black and whites there's just going to be parts of the texture that are going to be completely transparent and parts of the texture that are going to be completely opaque and nothing much is happening in here we want to make sure that the texture can repeat itself along the s and t uh, wrap axis we're setting the anisotropy to 4 this is going to help to improve the filtering quality of the texture when we are seeing it from grazing angles and you can change these numbers to change the scale of the grid effect finally we can import the floating grid and we're all set all the elements of the original scene are now set in place we have the car the floating grid the grounders reflecting the objects the rings and the boxes the post-processing effects we're missing just one last ingredient and that is setting everything up in motion and that's going to be the topic of the next and last video of this small series describing the implementation of this little project and i hope that you guys are enjoying the series so far so yeah hope to see you on the next video